Hallelujah. How many of you are ready to receive the Word of God this morning? Yes. It's a privilege and honor to be with you. I want you to stand with me and grab your Bibles or your... You know, a lot of folks use their, their phones and whatever today with healing scripture, you know, with the scriptures on it. I always tell everybody, <coughs> your Bible or your instrument of scripture. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. As long as it's scripture, not uh, Facebook or anything like that. But, or texting or whatever. Praise God. But anyway, all right. Hallelujah. Hold that up to the Lord and just say this after me. Lord Jesus, I confess you are my Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for giving to me the written word that I might know you. I believe that I receive this day the word of truth that will set me free. I place demand upon the anointing of God to impart unto me everything I need to live victoriously in this life. I set myself to hear the word, to receive the word, and be a doer of the word. And I thank you, Lord, for producing fruit in my life. I declare it so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Pastor talked to me about the word of faith, and I prayed about various things that we should do and look at. And I want to begin here in the first chapter of Colossians. And we're going to pick it up in verse 3, read down through some verses here. Paul writing to the church of Colossae. He says here in verse 3 of chapter 1, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now notice Paul is saying, we're thanking God for you, and we're praying for you. Amen. Well, I wonder what he's praying. I wonder if these people are saved. Well, of course they are. He's writing to the church. In fact, he declares they're saved. He says in verse 4, Since we heard... Everybody say heard. heard. Notice that they weren't quiet about their conversion, were they? People should have heard that you got saved. Yeah. Amen. They heard when you were a sinner. So they should hear when you get saved. Amen. They should hear about it. And if, you're, and if people haven't heard about it, then you're not letting it out. Amen. Amen. So Paul says, we, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you had to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and brings forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard it and, and you knew the grace of God in truth. Now Paul here tells us, he says, listen, we've heard that, number one, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've heard now that you're walking in love. And so we know they're born again because John writes in his epistle and says, we know that we pass from death unto life because we love. Amen? So they're loving each other. So these are fruit that's being operated in their life. And then notice it says, and for the hope that's laid up in heaven for them. Meaning what? They're looking into eternity. They've given their lives to God. You know, I tell everybody all the time, when I got saved, I didn't get saved till the first little problem come along. I didn't go to the altar and say, now, Lord, I'm going to live for you until I get disappointed. Right. Lord, I'm going to stay saved till somebody smarts me off or somebody persecutes me or something doesn't go my way or a prayer doesn't get answered. That's, I'm going I'm to stay with you as long as I don't have any problems. No, I don't know about you, but whenever I got born again, I got saved for eternity. Yeah. What do you mean? I got, I got in it for the long haul. Hallelujah. I'm planning on being around here for a long, long, long time. As long as Jesus is, I'm going to be. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. And so I, I, I got saved, and I got this decided, blessed be God, that I, I'm not going to let, you know, people bother me. In fact, whenever I first got born again, I, I was at, actually going to East Tennessee State University, and I was playing ball there and going to college, and, 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 and the Lord dealt with me, had an experience with God. And whenever he was dealing with me, here's something the Lord said, because he knew I, I had some excuses why I wasn't going to live for him. And the Lord said, now that you're giving your heart to me, I want you to understand that no preacher died on the cross for you. Amen. I did. He said, no church died on the cross for you. I did. No other Christian died on the cross for you. I did. Nobody on radio. See, I didn't know anything about TV then. But he said, no, I'd heard there was people on radio preachers. So he said, no, no preacher on radio died on the cross for you. I did. He said, so, don't you ever let a preacher, a church, another Christian, or anything you hear on the radio hinder you from living for me. Because as long as I don't let you down, you stay faithful. 
Amen. Praise God. In other words, I didn't get saved because of a preacher, because of a church, because of a Christian, or because of somebody I heard on read. I got saved because Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And I got saved forever. And I just made up my mind I was going to stay with him. Amen. Because you see, preachers sometimes will let you down, but Jesus never will. Churches sometimes will let you down, but Jesus never will. Sometimes you may hear something on the media that might let you down, but Jesus never will. Amen. So you get saved for the Lord. You know what then? When you get saved for the Lord like that, you can live for him, walk for him, praise God. And you can see that there's problems in churches. Somebody said, well, I'm going to find me a church that doesn't have any problems. You'll ruin it. Because <laughs> just as soon as you show up, it'll have problems. Amen. <laughs> Because, you know, we're people. Amen? Yeah, we have different things we've got to go through. And so, so, you know, everybody has good days and, 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 and you know, trying to get good days. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Like one fellow, he said, you know, his young, young Christian, he went to a church and they'd have testimony time. And an older gentleman was there and he'd always stand up and talk about how good the Lord was and how he was blessed. And so after several times of hearing this old gentleman exhort, the young boy, the young Christian went to him and said, sir. Uh, you know, I have problems all the time. Seems like every time you get them testify, you're always having good days. Don't you ever have any bad days? He said, no, son, I don't have bad days. He said, well, what do you do? He said, I have up days and getting up days. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And that's what we ought to be. We ought to have up days and then getting up days. Hallelujah. Because we're going to live for God no matter what comes our way. Amen. Now, listen to what he says. He says, since you, you heard of the truth of the gospel, he says, you, you put your hope in God. And he says, and, and he said, this, this gospel in verse 6 is bringing fruit in all the world. You know the gospel work anywhere? Yeah. That's right. And you know what the gospel does? It reveals to us the word of his grace. It brings God's grace into our life. It brings his favor in our lives. It brings his blessing into our lives. And this word will work anywhere in the world. It'll work anywhere people will receive it, praise God. It'll work in any language. It'll work on any continent. It'll work in any situation, praise God. The word of God always works. Amen. But now Paul doesn't quit with his, his prayer here. He goes down here in verse 9 and says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, heard what? Heard that you've been born again. Heard that you're not, not quiet about it. Heard that you're excited about the Lord. Heard that your faith is out here working. Heard that you're walking in love. Heard that you're serious about living for God. Amen. 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 And you know, it's what we need to start hearing about churches in, the, in this nation today, that we are very serious about living for God again. Yes. Yeah. That it's a reality. That it's not just something we do on Sunday morning. It's something we do every day, praise God. Amen. 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 And so Paul says, since we heard that you're serious about this, since we heard that you really had an encounter with Jesus, since we heard that you're sincere about living for God, he says, he goes on, he says this, we, he says, we do not cease to pray for you. Now what's he going to pray? Said he said he's praying for him up there. Amen. What's he praying? Well, he's going to tell you here in verse 9. He said, We cease not to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Glory to God. What's he saying? He's saying God wants you to know what his will for your life is. God wants you to be filled. Notice he says with wisdom. What's that mean? He doesn't want you to just have knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to use knowledge. See, knowledge without wisdom is information. But knowledge with wisdom is inspiration. Hallelujah. It'll work in your life. It's revelation then, praise God. Because you see, Paul wants him to know the knowledge of God's will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Meaning what? Get it in your heart. You've got to get a hold of God's plan and God's purpose in your heart. You've got to get it down in your spirit. You've got to ask the Holy Ghost to help you to not only be able to quote Scripture, but live Scripture. Put it to work in your life. How do I make this thing work for me? Praise God. I don't need to just know what the Bible says. I want to know how to get what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. I want to know how to make it work in my life. I want to know how to be an overcomer in this life. I want to know how to live the Jesus life. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to be able to do his works. Praise God. And so Paul says here, now that you're serious about living for God, now that you've been born again, he says, here's what we're praying. We're praying for God to fill you up with the knowledge or the revelation of his will, of his plans and of his purposes, and to give it to you with the wisdom to be able to do it. Why? Verse 10, that you might walk word worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Whoo, glory to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Why is it that you have to have the knowledge of God's will? Because you can't walk in anything you don't know. Yeah. Notice that you, got, you, you have to get the knowledge and then you have to get the wisdom or the revelation of that knowledge and then you can walk worthy of the Lord. You know, you'll never walk in healing until healing becomes a revelation to you. You won't. You, you'll never walk in prosperity until prosperity becomes a revelation to you. You have to gain the knowledge. Jesus said in John 8, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen? Well, you've got to get in the truth until it becomes the truth in your life. I tell everybody, kind of jokingly, I had a situation back in the, in the uh, early 80s. I bought a car and, and actually shouldn't have got it. You know, just because you can buy something doesn't mean you should. And, and you know, I enjoyed that car for 30 days and then I had to pay the first payment on it and, and stuff. But, uh, you know, but you know, anyway, I, I drove that car and, and, and we used it and it was a nice car and, and it had everything. I like things with push buttons, I, you know, little gadgets on. I, I've been always a gadget person, amen. I like all those little things. And so this one, one of the things that got me on this, and it didn't even have a talking module. If you remember back, it was a, a, new, it was a Chrysler product. And, and you know, the door, but it'd say the door is ajar. It'd tell you what was going on. Fasten your seatbelt. I won't try to, you know, I tried to get a guy who was in computers in the early days there. And, and we were trying to figure out how to make it talk in tongues, but I, I couldn't get him to do it, praise God. But, but we, we worked on that module, never could get change its expression. But, but, you know, I bought this car, and it had everything on it except a cup holder. <laughs> and I looked everywhere on that car for a cup holder. I was so aggravated because I like to drink a cup of coffee, you know, and, and, and stuff. And so I drove that car for probably six months to almost a year. And, 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 and I fussed. I, I, I threatened to, uh, you know, write a letter to the manufacturer and ask him, why in the world would you fix this nice car up and not put a cup holder in it? And I, I got so aggravated, I went out and bought the, you know, they used to have them, you could put them in the window. Yeah, right. Cost you a dollar back in those days. A little plastic thing. So as soon as you hit it, it dumped it over in your lap. <laughs> yeah, amen. And so, yeah, I even thought about, I'm going to give me a drill and drill a hole right in the front of the thing and, and, and screw that in. And I thought, no, I can't do that. And so, you know, here I have this car, and it's got all these things, push button windows, everything else on it, and, and no cup holder. And I, 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 I just aggravated. And so one day, I'm out there in the car cleaning it up. Cleaning it out, you know, our kids were young, and so, so we are cleaning it up. And, and it had the front, you know, had a nice dash, had a little console down the front, and had little drawers in it. And so I'm cleaning all this stuff up. Now, looking down here on the bottom next to the floor is a little thing, looked like, looked like a little nipple, you know, that comes out where you can grab a hold of it a little. And I thought, what in the world is that? So I reached out, and I pulled on it, and it popped out and sprang open two deluxe super-duper <laughs> cup holders. Hallelujah. <laughs> Fanciest cup holders I'd ever seen in a car in my life. <laughs> and then I almost didn't want to tell my wife about it because I'd been gone for a year. And I thought, glory to God, I've had those cup holders there for a year. But you know what? I wasn't getting any use out of those cup holders at all because I didn't know anything about them. Didn't know where they were. Just because I found them that day is not the day that they were made. They were available to me the whole year, but I didn't get any benefits out of them at all because I didn't know they were there. Now, you know what's so sad about it? In the glove box of that car, there was a book. <laughs> and it had an index, A to Z, of everything that was in that car. And if I'd have made it over to the C section, <laughs> it'd have said cup holders. <laughs> and it would have showed me and told me exactly where they were and how to operate them. Yeah. But you know what? I didn't take time to get into their book, <laughs> the ones who made the car to find out what they put in it. You know what's, a lot, what's the problem with a lot of Christians today? We're, we're blessed with so many little extras, but we won't get in the book and find out what the manufacturer made for us. Amen. It's called the Bible. You've got to get in the Word. you got to get the knowledge of this thing. You see, I was sick all the time until I got a hold of 1 Peter 2.24, that by His stripes you were healed, meditated on it. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you where it was. 
We, it's 1977. Bonnie and I had just gotten a hold of some things by Brother Hagin, and, and, and a friend of mine who had graduated from Raymond had a healing, a list of healing scriptures. And so we'd gone to the church, and we, we, they gave it to me. And, and I, I was driving a little 1971 Ford Pinto. Hadn't gotten a hold of prosperity scriptures yet, amen. <laughs> but anyway, I, I was driving this little car, and, and, and it, it, was, it was bad. It was awful. But anyway, we were driving back from Tennessee back up to Virginia, where we were living at the time, and, and, and I'd been meditating on those scriptures and memorizing those scriptures. And you know why I'm driving along memorizing those scriptures? Had just been filled with the Holy Ghost just, that, you know, in June of that year, got filled with the Holy Ghost, read one of Brother Hagin's books on, on being filled with the Holy Ghost, read it and got filled with the Holy Ghost. And then, and then now I've got these healing scriptures, and I'm driving along, and I'd been meditating on it, and, and, and we were actually just almost right around the Withful area coming up through there and, and, and stuff. And, and I leaned over to my wife, and I said, I'm not going to be sick anymore. And, of course, she said, what? Because it was loud enough in there that you couldn't hear anything. Because even with the windows up, it sounded like the windows were down. Because, you know, yeah. it, it just roared. And I, I, I leaned over at her again. I said, I'm not going to be sick anymore. And it was just like some power force rolls right up out of me and, and went out of my mouth. And she goes, that's nice. I said, no, no, you don't get it. I said, listen, I've been meditating. God's will is for us to be healed. Amen. And, you know, I started walking in that. Now, that doesn't mean that I haven't had attacks on my body. I have. I've had physical attacks, had to believe God. But you know what? I found out that every time the enemies hit me, Jesus' power of healing is greater than the devil's power to make me sick. Amen? And I've been walking in health. Why? You cannot walk and be productive and fruitful in these things until you increase in the knowledge of God. And it's not just a, a book knowledge. You've got to get a revelation knowledge of who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and get it in your spirit and get the wisdom on how to make it work in your life. Amen? Because what we're doing is we're walking around with all these privileges and all these blessings that God has for us, and they're just lying there waiting on us to pull the lever to make him pop out. Hallelujah. And what's going to make him pop out? The wisdom of God and faith of God and the word of God operating in our life. Amen? Now notice something else here. He goes in on down in verse 11 and says, Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, and all patience, long suffering with joyfulness. Now, in Ephesians 3, Paul has a prayer over there. And in verse 16 in that prayer, he says that God, he asked God to grant unto us, the, the, with all the, the, the Spirit of God, that he would in, increase us in our spirit, and bring might and power into our inner man. Remember that? That you would grant unto us, that with all power and might, you would strengthen us in our inner man by the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Amen? So, so when he talks about strengthening us here, God says, not only am I going to give you the word, not only am I going to give you revelation of who I am and what I have for you, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost to strengthen you and anoint you so you can get this done. Aren't you glad you don't have to do this on your own? Amen. Aren't you glad God sent you a helper? Amen? And, and notice something else here. If we're going to live by faith, everybody gets, you know, you get teaching by faith and everybody gets that serious look on their face. You know, deadness comes all over them. Amen. No, they go, oh, i got to get serious with it. Notice how he says we're supposed to get, he says, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. In other words, God's going to use his power to strengthen you so you can get this done. Amen. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the Lord sent the helper to help us, strengthen us, guide us. Now notice what he says, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. You know what? This ought to be fun. Yeah. That's right. Amen. You know, you know, it, it is not just, oh, I've got to get serious and confess the word. No, you ought to say, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm going to have fun in this thing. Amen. Amen. You know, if you, you, you ought to enjoy the fight as much as you enjoy the victory. Amen. 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 I was one of them rare type of people. I played ball all the way up through college, and I enjoyed the practices. I did. I was always out there early. Praise God. I was always out there late. I enjoyed doing that. I enjoyed getting in the weight room. I enjoyed doing all this stuff. It was, it was, I, I just lived for it. I, I went to class so I could play ball. Amen. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, you know, now that I, and, and, and then, you know, praise God, I got born again. 
And I was going to that church that Pastor talked about earlier, you know, the Church of the Chosen Frozen, amen? And, and so we would go, and it was hard, and everybody was just struggling. And, and, I, and I sat there, and, and, and finally I just said, Lord, there's got to be more to this than what I'm hearing here. And I've always been one of those all-in guys. I, you know, if I can't do it all the way, I just don't normally do it. Amen. I don't do things I can half do. I do things I can all do. Amen. And so I told the Lord when I got saved, I said, now I was all in as a sinner. I'm going to have to be all in as a Christian or I ain't going to make it. Amen. And so the first thing Bonnie and I did was we, we got us a Bible. We didn't have a Bible. We weren't church people when we came along. We'd gone to church, but we weren't churchy. Okay. In fact, first time I went to church, after, you know, after having my encounter with the Lord, we'd gotten married, and we went to our, uh, the church here, and they was having communion service, and I asked Bonnie what they were doing. I'd never been in a communion service. I didn't have any idea what they were doing. And she started telling me, and finally she just said, just listen to him. He'll tell you. I don't know what he's doing up there. And so, you know, we took communion, praise God. And I thought that was really something. And so we got in the Bible. And, and how we got our first Bible, we're going to, we're going to college and, and, and working our way through. And then I got a scholarship. We, you know, some of y'all might remember. Most of you might not. But anyway, they used to have S&H green stamps. <laughs> And, you know, you could get the coupons when you, you know, bought gas and did different things. And we had a couple of books, and we went down to the redemption store and checked in our, our S&H Green Stamps book and got us a Bible. We had enough green stamps to get one, so we'd take turns reading the, the Bible. And we'd go to church, and you know, and, and, but nobody was having fun. And then, I, you know, Bonnie got attacked with some things in her, in her body, on, you know, in her gland. And, and so I saw a guy on TV laying hands on people, getting them healed. Yeah. And I said, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you healed. And so I, I said, you know, if I can find, she had a problem with a little lump came up on her neck. We'd just been married not quite a year. And I said, Lord, if I can find any place in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, I don't care what Testament, if I find any scriptures where you healed anybody with a knot on their neck, you'll have to heal my wife. Because I read over here in Romans, you're not a respecter of persons. That's pretty good for a Baptist, ain't it? Amen. <laughs> And so, you know, I found over in Isaiah where Hezekiah got healed, you know, and he had that bowl on his neck. And so I told Bonnie, I'm going to lay my hands on you. She'd been taking medicine for about three days. Doctor told her if it didn't get rid of it, they was going to have to take biopsy and all this stuff. So it was pretty serious. And so I said, I'm going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray and the Lord will heal you. Right here's a scripture where he healed this person. He'll heal you. And so I laid hands on her and prayed for her, and I felt pretty good about myself, hallelujah, <laughs> until I heard, you know, something splashing in the bathroom and, and a flush, and she ch chunked all of her medicine down the commode. And I went in there, and I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, the Lord's going to heal me. I'm not going to take his stuff. It's making me sick. I said, oh, God, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. I still believe, Lord. I still believe. I still believe. Amen. <laughs> I mean, we were just getting started in this thing. I mean, you know, she shook my faith real big. Hallelujah. <laughs> but you know what? Every day after that, she, she, she'd get, you know, I'd pray with her, and she'd feel better. She, if she was feeling a little pain, we'd get together and pray, and he'd go away. But you know what? She went back to the doctor the next week and consecrated herself sitting there in the waiting room. Still had the lump on her neck. You could feel it. And she's sitting there, and she said, Lord, I'm going to live for you and serve. We've made a commitment to live for you. Whether I get healed or I don't, it will never change my commitment to you. I'm living for you. And she got that little prayer out of her mouth, and the, and the lady said, Miss Huffman, come back here. So she goes back, sits down on the examining table, and the doctor comes in. She comes over and reaches over and fills up on her body and fills her neck. She goes, well, the medicine must have worked. And Bonnie reaches up, and the knot was gone. It disappeared from the waiting room to the examining table. Hallelujah. Because we'd taken our stand and we'd believed God. And, you know, so that started marking us as being different in our church. Hallelujah. <laughs> because, you see, when I got saved, I just believed that the Bible is the Bible and Jesus is Lord and the Word works. And, God, if I can find it, I'm going to do it. Amen. I want to live the Bible. And so we got a hold of, you know, some of Brother Hagin's stuff and got to feel the Holy Ghost, got left foot of fellowship from the Baptist, came on over among charismatics. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And went to Rhema and then got totally ruined. Hallelujah. <laughs> as far as religious folks think. But you know what we found out? We're supposed to live for God with patience. That means that, you know, you just stay consistent. Yeah. Long suffering. That means you're not easily provoked, not easily disturbed, not easily, you know, discouraged. With joyfulness. That means you're supposed to have fun while you're doing this. 
Yeah. Amen. That means you're supposed to walk in faith in fun. That means you're supposed to go to church in fun. That means you're supposed to pray in fun. You're supposed to have joy while you're living for God. We should be happy people, amen? amen? And when you find yourself not having any joy, you need to go back to your helper, the Holy Ghost. Say, Holy Ghost, this is starting to be too much me and not enough you because it's wearing me out. So, Lord, I need you to anoint me with some fresh anointing. I need the Holy Ghost to strengthen me in my inner man. I need you to put some power back on me. And, Lord, I'm going to go back and refresh myself in the Word of God. Hallelujah. Because you said I would increase in strength through the knowledge of the Word of God, and I would increase in joyfulness through the strength of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, Lord, for me to walk in faith and walk in victory, I need to stay full of the Word, and I need to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I want to tell you something. If you're not confessing the Word... And if you're not rejoicing and praising God and counting it all joy in the midst of your test and the trial, then you need to get a fresh dose of the Word of God, and you need to get a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come on. The church doesn't need any more new doctrine. The church doesn't need any more new fancy programs. What we need to do is get back in and get the spiritual wisdom and revelation of the will of God and the Word of God and redig the truths of God's Word, find out who we are in Christ, and say, Holy Ghost, just come in to me and anoint me until I get some laughter back in my life, till I get some joy back in my life, till I start doing this thing and I go to church with a passion in my heart. Yeah. I'm really going to expect something to take place today. I'm going to start making demand on the anointing of God because the Bible says it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. And so, Lord, I'm going to begin to believe you to destroy yokes out of my life. Amen? I'm going to start walking in victory, praise God. Now, Paul goes on. I want to just tie it up here in these last few verses here, in verses 12, 13, and 14. He says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. We don't understand that very much, but it, the one translation says able, and the, new, and the Amplified says qualified and fit. I like that. Praise God. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us able, who has qualified us and made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That word forgiveness there is more than forgiveness if you look it up in the Greek. It means remission of sins. It means he blotted them out. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we read that, and we read over about like I just did, and we go, Woo, hallelujah, that's wonderful. I'm going to praise God. I'm a partaker of the inheritance. Now, but, you know, if you read it in reverse, it kind of helps it bring a little bit more light to you. What are you talking about? Let's start in verse 14 and work our way up. Let's just do that. Somebody said that's not homiletically correct. That's all right. I didn't take homiletics. Amen. Look in verse 14. Look what he says. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness and the remission of sins. Now, once he's saying here, everything that I preach to you, everything I share with you, everything that's going to happen in your life, if you're going to produce fruit, if you're going to walk in love, if you're going to walk in faith, if you're going to have revelation knowledge, it all comes because you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and you have remission of sins in your life. Are you listening to me? It is not because of who you are. It's because of what he did for you. The main thing you should be celebrating today is this. You are the redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. That means you've been purchased of God. It means you belong to God. And he says forgiveness of sins. What's that mean? You're not just an old forgiven sinner. You were an old sinner. You got saved and became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Old things passed away. All things become new. And what you need to do is every day get up and say, Glory be to God. I'm not an old sinner. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, that sin no longer has dominion in my life. Yeah. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me. You ought to read 1 John chapter 1, verses uh, 7, 8, and 9 in the Amplified. It talks about if you walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you and keeps you from all contamination and all sin and all lawlessness. Hallelujah continuously the blood is working for me. Amen? And if I do mess up, blessed be God, I've got an advocate who is my blood covenant brother and I can confess my sins and he goes to bat for me and takes that blood and just washes them out and makes it look as if I didn't do anything at all. Amen? Amen. 
Come on, folks, you need to grab a hold of this, that you are the redeemed of the Lord. In the ninth chapter of Hebrews, Paul talks about over there, he says, listen, he said, if the blood of bulls and goats could cleanse your outward man, how much more does the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse you and bring you into an eternal redemption with Almighty God? Amen. Hallelujah. I am redeemed. David said in the 107th Psalm, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Amen. Glory to God. What should we be doing every day? We ought to get up every day, and it doesn't matter what it looks like. We ought to say, thank God I'm the redeemed of the Lord. The devil has no place in me. Sin has no place in me. Defeat has no place in me. My sins are forgiven. Therefore, I am no longer under condemnation. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is in operation in my life, and I'm going to be an overcomer today. Hallelujah. I'm going to walk in this stuff, and I'm going to have fun doing it. And folks, you know when you're real is whenever the symptoms start hitting you and you still have to sit there and just say, ha, 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 ha. I'm going to praise God anyway. And there's no feelings. There's no inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> Bonnie and I got hit with some symptoms here not too long ago. And, and, and we were just laying there. And, and I looked over and I said, I, I think we just need to get up and laugh for a while. <laughs> and you don't have to do that much with her. <laughs> Amen. You ever heard that person that dance at a drop of a hat? Well, Bonnie carries a hat around in her purse so there's nobody else has one. She'll drop it and dance herself. Amen. Praise God. But you know, every now and then, you just, you, if you don't have any joy, you have to count it all joy. Now, what James said? Well, how am I going to do that? Well, I know I'm redeemed. Praise God. And Jesus is my Lord. And so, therefore, blessed be God, I have a right to declare it. I have a right to rejoice in this. And I have a right to praise God. You know, the Apostle Paul did not feel, I'm sure he and, and Silas didn't feel at all inspired in that jail. Back over in that Philippian jail. You remember it? Around the 16th chapter of Acts? He's out preaching, doing a good work, establishing a church there. And what do they do? They take him and beat him and throw him in jail for doing what God told him to do. And so what does Paul do at midnight? At midnight, Paul prayed. And then what? Sang praises unto God. See, you've got to walk with all patience, long-suffering, and joyfulness. Joyfulness. You know Paul didn't feel like praising God. You know he didn't feel like singing praises unto God. But you know the Bible says, and the prisoners heard him. That means he wasn't quiet about it. Wonder what Paul prayed. Well, he didn't pray to get out of jail. Somebody says, what do you mean he didn't pray to get out of jail? Well, when the jail shook and all the doors were open, the jailer came running in to see if they were all gone, about to fall on his sword. Paul said, do yourself no harm. We're still here. Now, if he'd have been praying for God to deliver him out of jail, as soon as those chains broke loose and the doors opened, he'd look like a jackrabbit getting out of there, wouldn't he? I would have, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, if the whole place is shaking and you praying, God, get me out of here, and all of a sudden everything busted loose. So apparently he wasn't praying to get delivered out of the jail. He was praying for God to come in and change the situation and take charge. Hallelujah. Somebody says, now how can you say that? Well, it's right there in the Bible. Read the Bible. Paul was practicing what he preached. He's counting it all joy. He's practicing his faith. And he's praying for God to turn what the devil meant for bad into something that's good. And so what does he do? He gets the jailer saved and his family saved. And I believe probably those prisoners got saved. Somebody says, well, he started a church there in that jail. No, he didn't. He'd already started a church at Lydia's house. Right, and if he'd allowed them, if he'd have took off and escaped at midnight, what would that have looked like to all those new Christians over there? So what did Paul do? He didn't run from problems. He didn't run from a hardship. He turned the bad situation into a good situation by walking in faith, speaking his faith, praising God, and acting like the redeemed of the Lord. And the next day they had to come and ask him to leave. So Paul went from the tail to the head. 
Amen? He went from beneath to above. He went from the victim to the victor. Hallelujah. How? By standing in faith and saying, God, we're going to turn this thing around. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, the devil would like to come into this whole region, attack the church, and beat you down, and get you to quit, and say, well, ain't nothing ever going to happen here. Let's get out just as soon as we can find a place. Let's just go and run. But you know what God wants us to do in this hour? He doesn't want us to forsake our nation, or our cities, or our states. He wants us to rise up in the midst of the midnight hour, and get a hold of the fact that we're the redeemed of the Lord, that we have been delivered from the power of darkness. Are you listening to me? We have been delivered from the authority of Satan. He has no right to afflict us and win. And if we're going to turn this thing around, we're not going to do it by, by running at every opportunity or getting defeated at every opportunity. We're going to stand strong even when it hurts, and we're going to keep our joy, and we're going to praise God even if we have to put one on. Amen. Amen. Because if I'll start off in faith, the anointing will come. If I'll start off not feeling anything, the feelings will come. If I start off praising God without any inspiration, the inspiration will come. The Bible says God will always come where there's faith. He'll always come where people are praising Him. And praise is not just a feeling. Praise is my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Huh? Amen. Hallelujah. And so what does he say here? He says, number one, you're redeemed. Number two, verse 13, you're delivered from the power, the authority of darkness. Satan no longer has the right to control you. Yeah. What's that mean? Quit acting like he wants you to act. That's right. Quit doing what he wants you to do. Start being what God called you to be. Amen? I'm a child of light. I'm not a child of darkness. I don't live in darkness, walk in darkness, talk darkness, do darkness. I walk in light, talk light, live light, and shed the light. Amen? Amen. That means that, praise God, where everybody else is fussing, I'm going to start praising. While everybody else is criticizing, I'm going to speak my faith. While everybody else is giving up, I'm going to rise up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just going to begin to act like this thing will work. Are oh, you listening to me? I'm going to act like it'll work on the job. I'm going to act like it'll work in my home. I'm going to start acting like it'll work in my family. I'm going to start acting like this will work in my church. I'm going to start acting like Jesus really is Lord, and I really am redeemed, and I really am delivered from the power of darkness, and I really am a child of the, wall, of the Lord and, and the, a child of light, and I'm going to start living in the light. Now, once you understand that you are the redeemed of the Lord, and that you have been delivered from the power of darkness... And notice he says, translated. New King James says, conveyed over into the kingdom of the Son of God. What's a convey? That means like a conveyor. You ever seen a conveyor belt? You know, it takes something from this place and conveys it or moves it over to this place. What's he saying here? He's saying, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he redeemed you, took you completely out of the kingdom of darkness. You're no longer a part of that kingdom. You don't have that nature. You don't have that heart. You don't have that lifestyle. You have been delivered, and Satan no longer has say in your life. The devil is no longer your Lord. Jesus is your Lord. You're in the kingdom of God. Do you understand you don't get into the kingdom of God when you go to heaven? You get in the kingdom of God when you make Jesus Lord. What is the kingdom of God? It's God's realm. It's God's righteousness. It's God's anointing. It's, it's, it's the space. God's kingdom is all over the earth right now. You understand that? If it wasn't, people couldn't get in it. And Jesus is Lord over that kingdom. And whenever you make him your Lord, that means you put yourself under his rule and authority and domain. That means you come under his laws and his government, his influence. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and says we're ambassadors for Christ. See, just because you're in a, in a, if you're an ambassador for this nation and they send you to some other nation, that doesn't put you under the laws of that nation. That embassy that you're in is a part of the American government. It belongs to America. It's, it's, it's sovereign ground. And even if you go out and shop in the, in the streets, if, if you're an ambassador, you, you go out and shop. You're still not under their laws. You're under American laws. You understand that? If I go to another country as an ambassador, if I'd go to Russia, I don't salute the Russian flag, I salute the American flag. 
I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. Are you hearing me? I'm surrounded by the kingdom of darkness, but I walk in the kingdom of God. I'm not ruled by sin and death. I'm ruled by the law of life in Christ Jesus. Righteousness, peace, and the joy of the Holy Ghost is supposed to be operating in my life. They have sickness, I have health. They have poverty, lack, and want. I have prosperity and sufficiency for every good work in my life. They have turmoil, I have peace. They have sadness, I have joy. Are you listening to me? And that's why he says in verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father. My God, we ought to be thanking God every day that He sent His Son. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through uh, 19 talks about God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. Yes. Uh -huh. Not imputing our trespasses. He's restored us back to favor with Himself. Yes. Real glory to God. Aren't you glad we've been brought out of the dominion, the authority and influence of Satan and brought back over under the authority of Almighty God? And God Himself was in Christ reconciling us into Himself, bringing us back into harmony and favor with Himself and not imputing our trust. What's that mean? God doesn't look at you and see what you did wrong. Thank God. God doesn't, when you make Jesus Lord, He sees you as a new creation. And he says, now then, here's what I have for you. This is who you were, but let's forget that. Here's who you are. Let's remember this. God told the prophet Isaiah in the 43rd chapter, write down, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions and will not remember thy sins or iniquities or lawless deeds for my sake. <coughs> Why? So he could bless us. That's why we can approach the throne of God. We go, Father, I thank you today because you've made me a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. All the blessings of heaven are now available to me. It's mine. Not because I deserve it, but because you qualified me and made me able and fit to partake of these things. See, 2 Corinthians 1 20 says, In him all the promises of God are yes and amen. Ooh, glory to God. What if it's God's will to heal me? Yes, and amen. What if it's God's will to meet my need? Yes, and amen. What if it's God's will to deliver me? Yes, and amen. If you can find it in the Bible, it's yes, and amen. Why? Because Ephesians 1, 3 says that He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. Oh, that's up in heaven. No, it's in Christ. But here's the key. I'm in Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If any man be in Christ, yeah, right, right. he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new. So I'm in Christ. So what's that mean? I'm in the place where the blessings are. Yeah. And since all the promises of God are yes and amen, that means all those blessings that I can walk around and look at, I have a right to. Yeah. Then why am I not getting it? Because you haven't found it. You got to find this stuff. That's why Paul said, I'm praying for you that God will grant to you the knowledge of his will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I'm praying for you that you can get a revelation of everything God has for you so you can walk in it and be productive in it and fruitful in every area of your life. And he says, and while you're walking in these things, just stop and thank God for it because it's Him. He is the one who's qualified you and made you able to have this stuff. Because it was God in Christ who delivered you out of sin and darkness when you couldn't get out yourself and brought you over and put you in the kingdom of His Son and made you a part of His family, gave you the spirit of adoption and caused you to call Him Abba Father and made sure you was redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and your sins are forgiven, remitted, and blotted out so that you could go before God without a sense of guilt and condemnation. So he says, walk in that. Walk in that. Now, here's the thing. You and I get a revelation of this and start walking in this. We'll have to find places bigger. Because, see, this is a truth that the devil is concealing from the world. Any sinner with half a brain, one eye, would give up going to hell to come serve a God that would bless him like this. Yeah. Some people say, yeah, I tell everybody all the time, I just made a good decision. 
Jesus revealed himself to me. I tried the world. Some people say, there's too many hypocrites in the church. I said, well, I was out in the world for, you know, several years, and I found a whole lot more hypocrites out in the world than I did in the church. And I made up my mind, if I was going to have to live with the hypocrites, at least I was going to live with the ones going to heaven. <laughs> Amen. But I just made up my mind, I, I was going to, I, you know, this is, this is a better deal. Yeah, right. And I made the commitment to Christ long before I knew anything like this. And you know, I believe that's why Paul's writing to these Colossians. Because they made a decision that they want to make Jesus their Lord long before they knew everything that belonged to them. But now that you're saved, what are you going to do? Now that you're saved, how are you going to live? You're going to, you're going to drive around just barely getting along? Or are you going to get a hold of what God has for you? and start applying it in your life. Because I'm going to tell you, the greatest witness that we can be is not passing a track out to somebody, but is allowing them to see the Lord working in our life. When they see Jesus in us, and they see us walking in these things, and excited about these things, and passionate about these things, and speaking our faith, and letting God do these things in our lives, that is what's going to draw people to the Lord. Amen? So what are we going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a hold of what God has for me. I'm going to start walking in my redemption. I'm going to start doing it with joy. I'm going to have fun being a Christian. Amen. 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 See, I have fun doing this. I don't get up here and preach for your sake. Yeah. I preach for Jesus' sake, and you get in on the blessings of it. Right. Right. I don't preach just so that I can entertain people. I, pre I enjoy doing this. You know what I'm saying? I enjoy studying the Bible. I enjoy praying. I enjoy preaching. I enjoy taking what God's given me and sharing it with other people. I enjoy fighting the good fight of faith. Yeah. I really do. Sometimes I get a little weary. I, you know, Paul says, don't let yourself grow weary in Galatians 6. But you know what he says do? He just says, stir it up. Yeah. Stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Praise God. And so whenever I find myself getting a little cranky or a little not having any joy, I just stop and say, wait a minute, I can't win like this. I got to back up, get refreshed, get renewed, get my faith back up there, get some joy in my mouth and get some joy in my life and start praising God and start having fun at this thing again. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's how your faith works, folks. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. That's how your faith works.